Hi, good morning. This is Greg Lois. Thanks for joining me today. Today we're going to be doing an update and a conversation and hopefully asking or answering a lot of questions, I should say, about the recent changes to the workers' compensation law in New York. Uh, this is sort of a special uh, presentation. We did one last month after the uh, law changed. The law did change effective uh, April 10th and a couple of days later we did a presentation. So this is sort of departing from our normal webinar series and in the handout you received today uh, there's lots of references to prior conversations and prior presentations we've done on a lot of the topics we're going to touch on today. I'm really going to approach today like a 201 level or maybe even a 301 level discussion pretty in depth of this topic uh, and my presumption is going to be that you've already been attending our webinar series, that you have my handbook, that you have uh, you know, read our articles, that you've been keeping up to date with this stuff. My goal is to go through the information pretty quickly and then answer your questions as quickly as I can. I'm going to try to get to every question and I know I may not get to everything. Um, I see that right now I have a little dashboard in front of me and I can see uh, how many people we have in the presentation. It's many more people than we had signed up this morning even at 6 a.m. when I sent out the handout. So if you're attending today and you don't have our pretty lengthy handout which gives a sort of side-by-side uh, -side comparison of the old law, the new law, and then gives our uh, opinions, and really this is my opinion about how these things are practically going to be applied in the defense of workers' compensation claims, please shoot me an email and I'll make sure that you get that handout because it is quite extensive and I will be referencing it a little bit during today's conversation. So I'm going to do an overview, I'm going to discuss the changes in the law, I'm going to talk about which ones are perspective only. Uh, none of them, it seems, they all seem to be retroactively applying, except for, of course, the temporary disability credit. We're going to talk about how it's going to change the defense practice and how the uh, defense of your claims is going to be affected. And then I'd like to answer questions. I'm really going to try to go through the slides as quickly as I can and do the overview as quickly as I can, because I feel that by now you've had the handout and you've had sort of an opportunity to familiarize yourself with some of the big changes, and those are permanent partial disability, uh, the impact on that and the lack of our being able to argue attachment. Uh, the temporary disability credit, huge for us. Uh, the prescription drug formulary, it really just means we're going to get another medical treatment guideline. Uh, the impact on IMEs and what does extreme hardship. So those are the stuff I'm going to talk about. If uh, people are still questioning whether or not this law is in effect, it absolutely is. It's been signed into law. Uh, it is effective as of April 10, 2017. There are 343 pages in the Senate uh, uh, budget bill. I really just picked out the parts that I thought were important to us. Please understand that I also skipped, particularly in the handout, a lot of topics that are not of interest to me or my clients. The fact that the Compensation Inspection Rating Bureau uh, was extended, who cares? I mean, every other state has one. I have to imagine they would do that, not news to me. Uh, the fact that they are codifying uh, the payer compliance, which has gone into effect now for two years, not a big deal. We kind of knew that was something they've been signaling for a long time, so I didn't spend a ton of time in either the handout. I'm not even going to touch on it at all. Feel free to ask me questions about those topics uh, in the, in, during the presentation, and I'm going to right now boop, boop, open up my um, question pane so I can see questions as they come in, and that's usually a good signal to me. Uh, for when stuff is, uh, you know, you've got an issue with it and you need me to spend a little more time in the conversation on it. All right, uh, let's talk about permanent partial disability. What's the big change? Well, the big change is the removal of the attachment defense. Um, this de defense is now entirely destroyed in that after the claimant is found to have a permanent partial disability, and we're talking about an LWEC, a loss of wage earning capacity award, we have no ability to raise attachment as a defense after they've been already classified, which is the term in New York for being found to have an established permanent partial residual disability. Now, the interesting little wrinkle to this is uh, that uh, we can still raise attachment, but at the time that permanent partial disability is found. So, uh, in the typical case where you've got a uh, uh, month-long process, the judge has set the case down for a trial on the nature and degree of permanent residual disability, loss of wage earning capacity. That trial or that uh, hearing procedure should really consider three things, medical impairment, vocational abilities, and functional abilities. At the end of all of that, the claimant testifies. So typically what happens is uh, we do the medical impairment testimony first. 
Uh, there may be hearings about vocational ability, and the claimant testifies at that time, at the very end of the case. The judge will then reserve their decision or make a decision at that time. At the time the judge sets the case down for a hearing or a trial on loss of wage earning capacity, your attorney should wait, raise attachment as a defense to loss of wage earning capacity being found. Uh, in that way, we can still preserve that defense at the time the claimant testifies, uh, typically regarding functional ability or typically regarding uh, vocational abilities. At that time, that's the moment when your defense attorney should be asking them questions like, where have you looked for a job? Have you registered with Workforce One? Have you uh, submitted a resume? Have you gone for counseling? Have you gone for training? What are you doing to actually remain attached? Because at the time LWEC has found, they still have to be attached. The change in the law is now, after they have been found to have a loss of wage earning capacity, they no longer have to continue to demonstrate that they're looking for a job. They can just sit home, drink beer, watch Judge Judy all day, and uh, enjoy their workers' compensation tax-free money coming in. Okay. So that's the wrinkle, that's the best practice we think look going forward. And of course, the destruction of the attachment defense really completes the transformation from New York from a wage loss straight state as a theoretical construct for why we're compensating loss to really a whole man impairment state. Because if we're finding someone having a permanent partial disability, no longer even has to show that they're attached to the workforce or could be getting a job, really loss of wage earning capacity now becomes completely arbitrary. It is not tied to a wage loss theory of compensation. Uh, that actually does mean, though, that New York seems to be joining the vast majority of states. My understanding is 42 states, which have a whole man impairment theory of compensation. All right. Um, I think I've talked a little bit about ELEC. I'm not going to spend much more time about the attachment defense. Uh, please ask me questions about it. I know this is something that we've been doing a lot of counseling with our clients on, because raising attachment has been our classic way of pushing a case towards a Section 32 lump sum dismissal post, post uh, classification. Uh, now we're going to be relying on medical fights, uh, IME fights, weaning fights, other things to push these cases towards a Section 32 resolution. All right. Um, this applies to current cases. It applies to future cases. And of course, we think that the removal of the attachment defense is bad for employers. It's bad for us in terms of being able to tactically raise that defense and push these cases towards a Section 32. All right, uh, again, my final takeaway, best practice on this would be, remember, your counsel should be raising attachment at the time the case is set down for LWEC trial and at the time the claimant testifies and demand that they get testimony on that because you can absolutely still stay that benefit and force them to show attachment at that time. All right, if you need more on LWEC, there's lots of resources. Check out the handbook, I'm sorry, not the handbook, the handout today, which even has links you can just click on to download more information about it. All right, temporary disability benefit. Um, let's talk about that. The great news for us is that uh, we will, after 130 weeks of compensation, uh, be getting a credit towards permanency. Uh, at that point, after 130 weeks, we do start to get credit, and those weeks are credited towards your permanent residual disability. This is just makes common sense, right? I mean, uh, the bizarre idea in New York that someone could be on temporary, temporarily partially disabled or temporarily totally disabled for 10 years and then go get classified is ridiculous. Uh, it's one of the stumbling blocks and one of the challenges to getting cases moved, moved on towards LWEC or an SLU resolution. Um, our, goal, our hope is that this um, provides further impetus. Now, of course, of course, of course, uh, they do build in a backdoor escape hatch for our claimants to say, well, if I'm not MMI at that time, uh, then those weeks shouldn't count towards permanent residual disability. And of course, what physician, what treating physician in New York voluntarily ever finds a finding of MMI? Frankly, in my opinion, that's a unicorn. Uh, physicians in New York, particularly treating physicians, never find anyone's ever getting any better. They just want to treat them, treat them, treat them, treat them, treat them, treat them forever, put all their kids through college, dental school, law school, after dental school, et cetera. So this is still going to be a challenge, whereas we get closer to that threshold, uh, we're going to be definitely wanting to push towards MMI, and we're going to be uh, probably having to litigate some of that issue. So that exceptions is a problem. Um, we're going to push for that going forward. All right. Um, Let's talk about if it's good for employers. I think it is good for employers in new cases. Um, if you need more on temporary disability benefits or how we defend those, again, there's resources, particularly in the handout, you can simply click on those. 
All right, disability duration guidelines. We are going to see some changes to that, and that the changes will be to the SLU sections. This is great news for us. Uh, the number one or two or maybe three complaint I get from my clients is, man, these SLUs are huge, and they're frustrating. The frustration of an SLU in New York is uh, someone can sprain their elbow, have epicondylitis, uh, be out of work for two weeks, be out of work for three weeks, uh, go to their physician and get a 50% of the arm uh, SLU determination, go to our physician, get a 6% or 10% of the arm SLU determination. Uh, the judge is going to call that one sort of in the middle, and you're going to end up with a forty or $50,000 SLU award for someone who had minimal lost time, came back to the employment, is doing the same job or maybe even a more challenging or strenuous job, making more money, same money, and working overtime. And employers come to us all the time, they go, these SLUs are out of control. We're hoping that this addresses that. Now, uh, the uh, method of determining schedule loss of use is very easy on the physicians. Uh, it is uh, basically range of motion testing that they do. Uh, it is allegedly objective, but of course it's ridiculous. Uh, and uh, it does result in very high awards. So our expectation is that the board will be adopting uh, schedule loss of use evaluation guidelines which are more favorable to the employer, and frankly they can't be less favorable in terms of the overall findings of exposure. Uh, the board in its, I'm sorry, the, uh, the statutory change actually says that the board has to consider advances in modern medicine. In other words, hey guess what everybody, back from 1996, which is the last time these disability duration guidelines for, for scheduled loss of uses were changed, uh, in this 21 years, medical science has advanced and people are getting better outcomes than they did 21 years ago. And by the way, 21 years ago, they weren't exactly up to date either. So again, for all of these reasons, we're expecting that the schedule loss of use evaluations and findings should be better and more favorable to the employer. Now, we are not currently counseling our clients to delay or wait to get schedule loss of use findings. Uh, those um, new guidelines will not come out until December and they will become effective in January. All right. What is not changing? Uh, our crazy Kafka-esque system of determining uh, body parts such as low back, cervical spine, uh, all the disorders that require severity rankings uh, and reference to supplemental tables. None of that is going to change. That is staying the same. It is still obviously just craziness that they've made up. Uh, it seems scientific, it is clearly not, and my belief is that most practitioners don't even understand what the disability duration guidelines say. That's a conversation for a different date because the LWEC body parts, and I'm really talking about neck, thoracic spine, cervical spine, neurological, and respiratory, are not being affected uh, by the changes. These are going to be to schedule loss of use. Again, the new guidelines will become effective January 1, 2018. All right. Uh, they, uh, I've already said this, that the disability duration should be good for us because it has to reflect uh, modern advances in medical science and outcomes. All right, if you need more, there's references in the handout. If you didn't get the handout, shoot me an email and I'll send it to you because there's lots of links that you can click in there. All right, the board is uh, uh, required to come up with a comprehensive prescription formulary. It's very clear from the um, uh, statements made by the board at this time that it's going to be just another medical treatment guideline. They have until the end of the year to adopt this, and it should should um, uh, be favorable to employers. It will require mandatory drug utilization review. That shall be part of the regulations. There will be limits on compounding medication. This is where the doctor is combining uh, a stomach protector and a non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory together, and all of a sudden these two pills that separately might cost a dollar each are now costing 80 or or $100 a pill. That's going to be challenged and changed. Um, it will apply to current cases, of course, but only until after the guidelines are adopted. I think it should um, simplify the administration of cost centers. If you need more about medical treatment guidelines and medications, please uh, 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 check out the um, links and stuff we have in our handout. All right, IMEs. Uh, IMEs are going to be reviewed in 2018. Uh, they're supposed to be doing a pilot survey of this. A problem. Uh, apparently, they think there's a problem with IMEs. 
frankly, this is one of the states that has one of the most stringent and difficult IME processes uh, ever. Uh, it uh, results in many, many preclusions of our IME reports. It will apply to all cases after the adoption. I think this is only going to complicate something hopelessly already complicated. By the way, it's redundant. We already have impartial experts. If you want to have some real fun, check out the list of impartial experts. Impartial experts. I'm doing air quotes for those of you listening to our podcast. Um, they are not impartial. Many of them are actually treating physicians or uh, are well-known physicians who testify on behalf of claimants. Uh, particularly in death cases, um, in dependency claims. So my belief is that the impartial uh, physician panel is already uh, hopelessly captured by the treating physician and claimant's attorneys. Uh, further fiddling with this is only going to make it worse. Uh, our challenge from the defense perspective of IMEs is typically that some small percentage of them, something between 1 and 5 percent of IMEs, are just thrown out based on procedural errors Section 137 violations, uh, regulatory violations, who was served, who wasn't served. Uh, we do believe strongly that best practices for IMEs is to have defense counsels uh, prepare the letter that's going to go to the IME physician. We want these letters to be thorough, complete. We want them to have as much information as possible. Uh, and we have various arguments that we raised to argue to the judge of compensation that the independent medical examination should be given more weight than the treating physician and there's various reasons for that. Anyway, if you need more on this topic, there's links again in the handout, there's links up on the screen, and there's plenty on our website for that. All right, let's talk about expanding extreme hardship because the new law does say that the safety net where the claimant can claim uh, uh, opportunity for either increased disability or total disability. Uh, is now applied at 75% and above loss of wage earning capacity. The threshold was previously 80%. Uh, they've now significantly reduced the threshold. The, re the threshold is now 75%. Uh, they've also changed the appeal law, section 23, to allow the board to hear, uh, have a mandatory full board review uh, where the issue is the degree of disability and the disability would be above the uh, threshold. Um, they've actually already issued the changed board forms. There's already information on the board website on filing these extreme hardships. Uh, it will apply to all current cases. It's bad for us, obviously, because it's lowering that threshold for extreme hardship. Now, the board has defined hardship uh, as essentially financial. Uh, this is not a worsening of condition or a material worsening. A material medical worsening of condition, the impairment getting worse, would be grounds for a Section 123 reopener claim by the claimant. This is where the claimant would come forward and say, hey, uh, my LOEC was determined to be 60%. I have gotten progressively worse. My condition is affecting uh, new body parts and unestablished body parts. Um, it is worsening over time, and I can show an objective material worsening. Judge, I want to reopen this award and come back and have my award increased. That would be a Section 123 reopener. This is not that. This is essentially the worker, the claimant coming in and saying, well, my disability is 76% loss of wage earning capacity, and I have these terrible financial problems. The hardship uh, would be demonstrated by the claimant by presenting primarily uh, uh, financial records. Those would be things including household budget, household checking account, bills that they're receiving on a monthly basis, uh, the source of all other income, including Social Security, disability, or any other support that they would qualify for. Uh, and the claimant would have an opportunity to put all of these documents together along with documentation on a new form. The form is called the C-35 form. This form uh, would then be filed again with all of the documentation. That would be tax returns, wage records, uh, Social Security benefits, earnings, uh, benefits statements, uh, all of their bills that they're paying, including car bills, credit card bills, rent, et cetera, that would all be submitted to the board, and then that hardship determination would go before a workers' compensation law judge. Um, all right, a little bit more on the safety net on how it used to apply uh, is in my uh, uh, 2017 handbook, and of course, we've uh, done a lot of training on that. All right, so I see we've got some questions coming in. Uh, let's go to the questions, and uh, I'm going to scroll over here. So if you see my eyes going to the uh, other screen, it's because I'm going to scroll through our questions that we're receiving, and my hope is that we've received a ton of them. All right. Uh, how do I make this a little bit bigger?
Okay. Uh, question number four, number one, and I'm going to mangle this name. It looks like the first name. Oh no, the first name is Joe. Joe says, uh, "Does the 130-week credit apply to claims currently open and claimants are receiving temporary total disability?" The statute says that the 130-week uh, uh, credit would go for dates of disablement or, or injury after uh, April 10, 2017. So that's your answer. Uh, let's take a look and see if we have any other questions. I'm scrolling, scrolling. I don't, I don't see any. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them at this time. I can't believe that I would have answered everything that well. Uh, am I somehow screwing this up? I think that's it. Hold on a sec. Questions open, close. All right. Going once, going twice on questions. All right. Um, Tomorrow I'm going to be presenting a very similar presentation to this for the New York Claims Association. We are meeting at the New York State Insurance Fund building in Church Street. Uh, that is the uh, links to that are on our website. Um, again, I'm hoping the questions are working because I don't see any actual questions coming through with uh, nearly 100 attendees. I would expect to have more. But feel comfortable uh, emailing me questions or giving me a call after the presentation. I'm always happy to answer them. Um, next month we go back to our normal webinar schedule and we'll be talking about the going and coming defense. Okay, I hope everybody has a wonderful day. Wait, I got another question. I got another question. And this is a question from Mark and Mark says, hey, does hardship start at 75 or 76? And the answer Mark is 75%. It says 75% or higher uh, hardship begins. Um, okay, and that's it. I'll hope to see everybody next week. Thanks for joining us today. Have a great day.